Um, I tooled around quite a bit with the introduction, introduction of today's message. And I'd like everyone to have a look at the photo that I found up on here. It's the first slide there. Sometimes a photo is worth a thousand words. This photo, for those who may be unable to see it or are listening online, it shows a throng of people gathered together in Germany, presumably sometime in the 1940s. And there's only one man who stands out in the crowd. Can you see him there in the middle? He stands out because he's got his arms crossed. A cynical, unpersuaded look on his face in and amongst a crowd of jubilant, dutiful-looking Germans giving the Roman salute, presumably to Hitler or to his flag. Now, I don't know anything about this man. I don't know who he is, what his name is, or whatever happened to him. But I can tell you this, he was not conforming to the standards of the society around him. I was originally going to call this sermon, The True Rebels. But I found myself bogged down in confusing arguments about the mechanics of the title. And it was all very besides the point. But this photo can sort of show you what I'm attempting to get at this morning. We find ourselves in a society given over to darkness, all the way from the leadership down to the predominant accepted moral standard of our culture, as with this man, as with many followers of God throughout all of history. And this photo should give us pause to consider where do we place our hope? Where do we place our hope of salvation? Now, I'm sure to these Germans who'd suffered years of war reparation payments to the victors of World War I, they were suffering great inflation and, and terrible suffering. <clears throat> I'm sure that the Nazi message was tantalizing and tempting. But be careful where you put your hope, who you put your hope in, and why. Idolatry is when something other than God is put in God's place, and particularly when that thing has some sort of dark spiritual backing behind it. Don't be carried off with the politics of the day. Be cautious and suspicious of putting your hope in any politician or man, <laughs> especially when their policies run contrary to the natural laws that the Creator has given. Mankind has never been able to save itself. Try as we might, we are doomed to fail outside of God, which is why God has provided us salvation as a free gift through the suffering, death, and resurrection of his Son. Now this photo also reminds me of a Christian hero, and this is not a photo, just so you know, of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. It reminds me of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a very outspoken critic during Hitler's rise to power. He was a Christian theologian who, I think he graduated seminary a, a couple years before Hitler's rise to power. He was vocal from the beginning against the Nazi euthanasia programs and their genocidal treatment of the Jews. He was head of an underground seminary where he trained pastors. The Gestapo banned him from entering Berlin. He helped some Jews escape to Switzerland. And for a time, he escaped Germany and he sought refuge in America. But after, I think it was a couple months, he ended up feeling compelled to return back to Germany to, re to, to be with his countrymen, to suffer with them, and to resist 
with them. On his return, the Nazi authorities forbade him to speak publicly or to even publish any material. And they required him to report regularly to the police authorities of his weekly activity. Despite this, he joined a German resistance organization where he forsook his former pacifist views and involved himself in a daring plot to attempt to take Hitler's life, Operation Valkyrie in the history books. The assassination attempt failed as one of the briefcase bombs was not armed in time and the other detonated under a heavy table and the heavy table leg was in possession to protect its intended target and Hitler did not die. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was never married though his engagement was announced right before he became imprisoned. It's a, it's a very fascinating story. This is sort of the super short version. He spent about a year and a half in prison before the diary of the head of the resistance group he was with, the diary was found and he was incriminated personally through that diary along with a bunch of others, and Hitler ordered their destruction. He was transferred to Flossenburg concentration camp, where eventually he was marched naked to hang by a noose on April 9th, 1945. Flossenburg concentration camp was liberated by the Allies 14 days later, April 23rd, 1945. Now, this is a heavy story, but it's also an ex inspiring example of a Christian doing his best to live out his beliefs, warts and all, in defiance of the culture he was immersed in. And I do want to be clear, I am not advocating for the assassination attempts on politicians' lives from the pulpit. <laughs> Jesus warns us that those who live by the sword die by the sword. And I know that Bonhoeffer understood this, and it, it weighed heavy on him. He actually wrote about this. He, he, had, he had things to say about it. He was torn about it. He weighed the risks. He made a calculated personal decision to accept any and all consequences on earth and before his maker. So that's... Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and you take a man like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and I've read his book called The Cost of Discipleship, and I've partway through his other book, Ethics, and it's really thick and it's hard to read. <laughs> but he left some inspiring quotes, and I couldn't cho choose just one, so I'll read you two. He said, Salvation is free, but discipleship will cost your life. And I'll read you another. Bonhoeffer says, He who fears the face of God does not fear the face of man. He who fears the face of man does not fear the face of God. And I have the photo just one more time there. This photo can sort of lend some context to our modern day brains in understanding the gravity and the weight of a familiar Bible story. So let me refresh everybody's memories of the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego found in Daniel chapter 3. I need a big drink for this. Of water, yes, my dear. <coughs> so the next slide, you can all hopefully squint and read along. I don't know if that's big enough. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then the king 
Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Next slide. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Where are we? Not yet. Okay. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So he brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Oh boy. <laughs> Pardon me. That you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into the burning fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Next slide. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. <laughs> Wow. Wow. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated, and he ordered some of these mighty men in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Next slide. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? 
They answered and said to the king, True, O king. And he answered and said, But I see four men, unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like that of a son of the gods. And Nebuchadnezzar came to the door of the burning fiery furnace, and he declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over their bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed. And no smell of fire came from them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks against the god of the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other god who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar praises God, chapter 4. King Nebuchadnezzar, to all peoples, nations, languages that dwell in the earth, peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. <laughs> what a powerful and inspiring story. And it speaks to me so deeply because it's so relevant to our present day. It's universally relevant throughout the ages. As followers of God, we will never really fit in. I have found myself recently feeling like I really do not fit in to our culture. There's so much happening in our present day culture that has me confused, upset, and concerned. There are laws being passed in our country that have me confused, upset, and concerned. <laughs> what do I do? Do I sign a petition? Donate to a politician, join a political party, start a militia, plan a coup? Well, so far, I've tried yelling on the internet a little. <clears throat> but the futility of simply being reactionary has got me questioning what exactly is the message that I should focus on expressing. Does that make sense? So how can we actually make an impact on the people and the culture around us? You see, there's a difference between my boat getting rocked and the insanity, or by the insanity of our culture, and these three guys rocking the boat of an entire civilization. They didn't intend to. They didn't ask for it. They didn't plan it. They didn't pursue it. But when their time came, and the entire kingdom of Babylon was peer pressuring them to submit, they didn't flinch. They didn't give an inch. They were committed to their convictions. They were just cool as a cucumber facing down certain fiery furnace death. <laughs> their temperament seems immovable. I think my favorite part is where they politely 
respond to Nebuchadnezzar so matter of fact, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. <laughs> they knew exactly where they stood. They were defiant dissidents of the culture around them. They were rebellious agitators. They were somehow politely resistant. I had a different word, but my wife tells me I'm not allowed to say bad words. <clears throat> God never called us to fit in with the world. He didn't call us to pander to it. No. He called us to die to it. And the next slide is Romans 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by the testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And the next scripture is Mark 8:34. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will find it. Take up your cross and follow Christ. Live your life as a living sacrifice. These concepts of end, the mantras that we hear in our culture, this is definitely not raising our vibration for the spiritual awakening. This is not believing in ourself. This is not trying to manifest our destiny through positive thinking, <laughs> right? <laughs> this is the thing here. God has called each and every single one of us here this morning to the fiery furnace. This is not a place we want to go. It's not at all enticing. He says, pick up your cross and follow me. He says, deny yourself. He says, whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will find it. That's the spiritual principle that is our guidestone to mark our path as we move forward on the path that he has set before us. And what that means, like in Daniel 3, these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they have withstood the test. They have the courage and the faith to refuse to a false god. And in and of their own strength, that's about how far they can bring themselves. Right? they got themselves into the furnace. Wow. We have a God that meets us in the furnace. He fights our battles for us. But we have to show up for the war. That's what he's done on the cross. Because God loved us, he does the work. He is the warrior. He has finished the work already. But our job is to stand up, to stand up for him, stand up for the truth, stand up for what we know to be right. He will fight our battles. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. That's not our place. Our place is to be obedient. Our place is to listen. Our place is to follow, to stand for truth, to do what's right and pleasing in the eyes of a righteous God. And he meets us in the furnace because he is that fourth man. One moment. I'm getting excited and dry.
So this is difficult to express into words. You see, in every age, the devil has tried to sell his wares on humanity, saying things like, you can be as gods, and trying to wedge us away from the Almighty, sowing doubt with his subtle accusations. He has some of us in our culture convinced that evil is good and good is evil. You see the trick? He sold sin and rebellion against the true God, Yahweh, as desirable. He's fooled entire cultures into every sort of degenerate depra depravity, and not least of all, ours. I don't know if you've noticed things are getting pretty weird out there. Let's just say I'm not even sure that there's too many boundaries left to be pushed. Sin never really ends up looking the way that it's packaged in the box, though. It seems sexy, exciting, and enticing. It promises to hit all of our dopamine receptors, but once we get it out of that box, it's disappointing, it's awkward, and it ends up making us feel sick. Here's the thing. That old usurper knows that the wages of sin are death. All of this is a consequence in our culture of following the path of iniquity, which can be summed up in the commandment of infamous occultist Aleister Crowley. Have you heard it? He's famous for saying, do as thou wilt. And you see this on t-shirts of pop stars and rappers, and it's, if, you, if you have heard it, you can see it. It's all over the place right now. And what an intentional counter to the truth, the way that Christ taught us. I think I have another one. Do I have another one? Jesus' prayer? Okay, no. I'll just read it. Never mind. <laughs> Sorry. Christ says, This then is how you should pray. Our Father hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Can you see the absolute polarity, the contrast? The counterfeit has everything to do with exaltation of self, indulgence of self, worship of self. The legitimate legal tender taught to us by Christ shows us who our God is. He's our Father. That He is holy. And that we are to forget about ourselves and be about His business. To forget about ourselves and rather seek His kingdom and to do His will and to trust Him to meet our needs. Because this brings us life. Let me posit to you a question that has been confounding me, thinking about all of this. Is it rebellion against anything at all to simply satiate your every desire? Lust, greed, envy, wrath, gluttony, laziness, gossip, slander, or murder? And I'm sure there's a long list of other sins that I couldn't think about. <laughs> what have we resisted? What are we rebelling against? All you've really done is show that you have not been able to exercise self-control, that you are a slave to the easy thing to do, to sin. Sin is sometimes just a demonstration of selfishness. Other times, it's downright sinister and evil. Now, let's just for a minute make a parable of the story of Daniel 3 and call sin Nebuchadnezzar's golden image, okay, in our hearts. Is bowing down to it the act of a dissident standing up to a tyrannical dystopia? If our hearts could be a tyrannical dystopia, enslaved to sin, <laughs> right? 
No. No. Sin is simply conformity to this world, conformity to the kingdom of darkness. If we hope to change this world, it begins with a revolution in our own hearts, standing in the strength and the courage of God in the face of sin, standing in the power of his grace. Okay, now the next one. <laughs> Romans 6, 6 to 14. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your member to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no mastery, no, sorry, so for sin will have no dominion over you, since you are under law, you are not under law, but you are under grace. So I'm, I'm putting things in these terms not to promote a form of legalism, but because it's very useful for me to change my paradigm in understanding in resisting sin. If I can understand its effects on me, the consequences it has, and the price that it demands, it begins to lose some of its appeal. <laughs> it's hard to stop eating sugar because it tastes so good, but it can quickly make you sick. For me, I have a terrible sweet tooth, so it's a battle between desiring to eat food that holds little no nutrition, that gives me heartburn, it raises the inflammation, and therefore the general pain levels in my body, it lowers my immune system, contributes to brain fog, gives me a roller coaster of sugar highs and sugar lows, and a general feeling of self-loathing, all for a moment of yum, <laughs> right? Worth it? Not so much when I think about it in that way, right? You see, it's very useful to recall all the consequences that the indulgence of sugar takes out in my body in pursuit to resist its hold over me. There's even been a couple times that I have refused to eat my kryptonite, saltwater taffy. But that's what it's about, surrendering the good of your taste buds for the good of the well-being of your body. God calls us to surrender our life, its desires, needs, and wants to the good Father for our spirit spiritual well-being. Can you trust him to the furnace? Can you trust him to the cross? How can we hope to change our culture if we haven't allowed God to change our hearts? How can we refuse to bow to the false idol if we haven't laid ourselves prostrate to the true God? How can we... Oh, sorry. What happens in our hearts affects those around us. Love mends and dissolves fear. Joy uplifts. Peace calms. Patience restores. Kindness disarms. Generosity nourishes. Faithfulness reassures. Self-control protects. If we submit our will to God, then we can serve our fellow man. Otherwise, we're all just out there fighting with each other over the table scraps. Next slide. What's the golden rule again? 
Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all of the law and the prophets. To the kingdom of darkness, the submission of one's life to God, the acknowledgement to his authority, the surrender to his laws, to behave in a selfless manner, this is a rebellion against it, against the kingdom of darkness. And it fears it. Who would willingly give up their own life and live for God? Yes. <laughs> this is the way that our teacher has shown us. And it's radical. It's counterintuitive to our base instinct. Now, on a podcast I recently listened to, there was a man named Carl Tikrib who teaches a course on secular trends at Miller Bible College in Saskatchewan. He says in the interview, and this is going to be a long quote, okay? Secularism is just the intermediary period, that pause between one dominant religious worldview being phased out and a new one entering the picture. And what's ironic is that this is not a new one at all. It's an old, old worldview. It's the worldview that the early church emerged out of. That was a pagan mindset, a Roman one's mindset. And so I see that as a return to that Roman one position that essentially says that man and nature is all part of the divine, however you define that. The concept of oneness. You know, this notion that God, man, and nature are essentially the same. They share a commonality at their core. They are really one. That's what the New Age teaches us. That's what's in the realm of the occult. The bottom line is that, under oneism, God is not transcendent, God is not separate, God can be you, God can be the mountains, God can be the ancient deities revisited now through the cycles of nature. This is a pagan, I'm not saying this, this is, anyway. Um, whereas in the biblical position, the biblical worldview is that God is separate. God is distinct. He's utterly unique. The God that we serve in the Bible is fundamentally different from the creation. So instead of oneism, the way the pagans' worldview views nature and the divine, Christianity views reality not as dualism, but as twoism. So God being one, and then everything else being distinct and separate from him. And there's a unique qualifier between him and the rest of creation. I think that this interview and the pagan concepts he describes in contrast with the biblical worldview just there really helped me to understand in such a simple way part of the ideological struggle we face as Christians today. We are immersed in a secular culture that's embracing old pagan concepts that are taking form in spirituality, new age, occult, and transhumanism. We are immersed in this stuff in our culture so much that we're desensitized to it. Concepts as old as the fall of Lucifer and the fall of man are simply rebranded that we can be like God that we are one with the divine, that we can become our own gods. Through the very act of sin, we are, in a sense, challenging God, putting ourselves as the lawmakers before him. We are called to take up our cross and follow him. We follow him and submit to his word as a response to his love for us, not 
for fear of death and hell, but because he saved us through his work on the cross from the dominion of fear and hell. Or sorry, death and hell and fear. <laughs> when you look and consider the big picture parable of Daniel 3, standing obediently to God in defiance to the culture of the kingdom of darkness, and then we look at the micro, because we've kind of got two different ways of viewing Daniel 3. One is us in relation to our culture, and the other is us in relation to the dominion of our own heart and the sin that we wrestle against, right? Our own personal struggles, personal struggles against sin in pursuit of righteousness, in pursuit of surrender to the kingdom of God, and our rejection of the kingdom of darkness. I guess the connection is that there's an acknowledgement that happens in the space of our heart, an acknowledgement and a repentance, an acknowledgement of the Lordship of Jesus Christ, the ultimate authority of Yahuwah. There's an acknowledgement of your place in the grand scheme of things. Even though we may fail time and time again, we understand that we are under control, we are under the grace that is granted to us through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We acknowledge that the trespass through sin, in the heat of that sin act, the trespass is, is that we are declaring in a sense that we are our own small g gods over our own life, creating and abiding by our own law. But in that attitude of brokenness and repentance, in that state of grace and good standing between you and God, you can come before him and reject that notion of that trespass. And you're calling it out. You're surrendering that whole idea. You're surrendering that whole thought pattern and saying, no, you, God, are the ultimate authority. I am your humble creation. And I have made an error of judgment. I have committed offense against you. Please help me to overcome this. There's nothing religious or legalistic in this pursuit of holiness, but it's relational pursuit of holiness in our attitude, in our heart, of surrendering to the Lordship of Yahweh, the Lordship of Jesus. And that's how the cultural and the personal, the macro and the micro, interconnect from our personal struggle to the cultural. We cannot be courageous and confident and stare down the culture around us until we have dis settled the dispute of lordship in our own hearts. If you have not surrendered in your heart to God, you can bet that when your time of testing comes, your knees will be too weak to stand in defiance of the crowd. And you will instead attempt to save your own life. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood up, they refused to bow down and defied their king and countrymen. They did so with not a second thought because the matter was already settled in their hearts. They already knew who they served. They had already bowed themselves to God. How could they bow to any other? Because they were ready, they were willing, and available servants of the Most High God. God was able to meet them in the furnace and turn that entire culture on its head. Nebuchadnezzar was so astounded that he sent out that proclamation of acknowledgement to the Most High God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to all the corners of the dominion of his kingdom, saying, How great are his signs! How mighty his wonders! 
<laughs> his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. Their story, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, certainly challenges the current day's stereotype of the weak, agreeable, pushover, nice guy Christian. Now there's a difference between being a coward, a person who lacks the courage to do or endure dangerous or unpleasant things, and being meek. Enduring injury with patience and without resentment. It fascinates me, the story, to think the ones standing up to an evil tyranny and upholding the true God are considered by the culture they were in, for lack of a better word, rebels. If you rebel against a culture of rebels, are you really a rebel? That's just a tongue twister I made up. <clears throat> rebels, because they stood in defiance of the lie. Rebels against a corrupt and overbearing government. Rebels against a culture of idolatry and exaltation of self. Rebels against corruption, immorality, and compromise. A righteous rebellion. I don't know if God would want to call it that. But it's this weird dynamic. It's interesting to note that in the ba Babylonian pantheon of gods, Enlil was the storm god. Just like Pastor Barry was preaching last week about the Canaanite storm god Baal, or the Greek storm god Zeus, or the Roman storm god Jupiter. Since Genesis 3, mankind has faced a relentless deceiving foe, a pretender, a usurper, an imposter. The devil has tried to set himself on a throne of pretentious lies over mankind. In every age, culture, civilization, he has tried to rule over man, to turn man against his true creator, to fool man into attempting to be his own savior instead of turning to the one who saves. Even Jesus faced off with the devil in the desert during his 40-day fast. We read on the next slide here. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. That's my scary devil voice. <clears throat> then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. I have one final scripture for you this morning, and then I'm going to close. And I want you to remember, as we read this one, about that storm God. Ephesians 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following this, the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him, in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. 
For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should work in them. Walk in them. Excuse me. So, in closing, this morning I want to ask everybody to contemplate what is it in your life that's trying to impose its tyrannical lordship of lies over you? What is trying to persuade you to compromise your morals, to stray out of the will of God? Is there a persistent sin enticing you to bow down before it? Bring that situation to the Lord right now. Surrender it to Him. Confess it to Him. There is freedom. There is freedom in the furnace. And this morning, during the prayer time in the portable, one of the words that came up was consecration. And I think that that's what the Lord wants from us consecration of our hearts to Him alone. And I want you to remember those men in the furnace, when they were dropped in there, they were unharmed. What was the only thing that was burnt off of them? The ropes, the bindings that that beast system tried to entangle them and send them to their death. They were met in the furnace. Those were burned off. And they moved in freedom. The angel of the Lord. They found the freedom. So, there's freedom on the cross. He's already won the battle. All he needs for you is for you to show up and take a stand. Is there a challenge in your life that you need to face that is going to be difficult to take an opinion on? Will you need the courage to stand for the right thing? Bring that before him as well. Surrender it into the hands of your Savior and know that he will meet you in the furnace. And as a small act of faith, as a token of repentance and surrender of our will to God, as an act of consecration, let's stand together in defiance of the kingdom of darkness, refusing to kneel to any falsehood or idol.